question for you to start out the, today and just thinking a little bit about what this message is. What defines a successful church? What is it that we look for to see whether a church is successful or not? And this is, uh, this is audience participation. So you get to answer back to me. What are some of the things we use to define whether a church is really uh, successful or not? Patty? Numbers. numbers, okay. Like in the book of the Bible, numbers? Okay, okay, good. Somebody else? Pat? Ch children, okay. We just sent them out of here, okay. <laughs> Not sure that w what that means exactly, but that's okay. What else? Yes, sir? Are they reaching people for Christ? Okay, that's a big deal. Okay. What'd you say, Pat? Oh, I thought you said wealthy. <laughs> oh, wow. Welcoming, warm, warm. Okay, very good. Jody? Missionary. Missionary? Missions-oriented. Yeah, missions-oriented. Somebody else, anybody? A good preacher. You're still looking for that one, aren't you? How'd you get stuck with the one you got? Okay. Well, there's an old song that we don't sing anymore today ever to speak of, but it's kind of it speaks to this a little bit. Give me that old time religion, right? Give me that old time religion. And then many times when we start thinking about what our church looks like and, and how healthy it is, we often do what you said, Patty. We look at numbers. How many came this week? How many were there last week? Is, are the offerings up? Or are they down? Or are they even with what we need? How many people went to discovery class or went to a class and all kinds of things like that. And I want you to know all those things are important to a point. But let's be honest, James doesn't talk about it, hardly any of those at all. And this is what I love about James. James is so intensely practical. And uh, this is where you see the rubber really meets the road. It with James. And this chapter in chapter one, which we've been at now for four weeks, and we're still not even out of chapter one. We'll get out of it. This will be the last one for today. But this chapter in chapter one, just consistently over and over and over, begins to lay out this idea of what it looks like to be a healthy and a good uh, church. And so what I want to do today, before I get into the message here, I want to give you a little bit of background, and then we're going to read the portion of Scripture that I've got, and then we'll kind of tear it apart and put it back together. Some background, first of all. There was a tension in the first century between Jesus and the Pharisees of his day. And many times the Pharisees had numbers in their head. That's what they look They look at the crowd and they go, this is trouble because this guy's got more power than anybody or maybe they're the kind of people that don't necessarily uh, pay attention to how many people showed up in somebody's house and heard Jesus preach and teach. But there is this, tense, this tension in their relationship with Jesus where the focus is on numbers, and it's not how many, how many seats we have in a building, but instead it is all about rules. So you have all these rules, and the more rules you the more rules that you keep, the better you are in God's eyes. That was what the Pharisees thought about the relationship that they had with God. It was all about the rules in that day. And if you look in Mark chapter five, seven, and I'm I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to do a couple pieces out of here. But there's a point there where the Pharisees look at Jesus and they say, "Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders?" instead of eating their food with unclean hands. That's all the Pharisees cared about, was the rules. We've got these rules, why are they not keeping the rules? Can you imagine yourself, if Jesus walked in here and started talking, if you, could you imagine yourself raising your hand and go, hey, why does your disciples not follow all the rules? I think that would be a terrible miscarriage right there, because... We're going to focus on Jesus, because here's why. Pharisees were tied up with the rules. Jesus was tied up with the what? The relationship. The relationship that he wanted to have with his people. And that is this relationship, and if you don't mind me picking on you, Ted and Bev, just a little bit, it's the relationship that Ted and Bev have with Jesus that drives them to spend 51 years clear across the world to help little kids come into Christian homes. Isn't that amazing? They're not doing it to keep up with the rules. 
And they don't really care that much about the numbers so much. They just want to see lives change, transformation, and that's happening. So you have this whole song that goes, give me that old time religion, and yet we don't really know exactly what that means at all. We just kind of sing the words. Well, you could take chapter one and let that be the definition of an old time religion. I mean, you just look through the chapters. You talk about, you look at how, how uh, James felt like that the relationship that we had with God would, first of all, help us to persevere through trials. That's what we talked about the first sermon. And then stand up to temptation. And then receive and respond the truth, to the truth. And then lastly, we see this definition of what a true believer looks like. Now I'm going to read in James chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 22, although we're not going to spend much time there, but I want you to get the background on all of this. It says there, do not, mer mer do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't you love that? I mean, can we get any more practical than that? Do what the word says. Just do it. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, stop right there for a second. And that last little sentence there, very important thing. The way you can get to the point where you don't forget what you have heard is to make sure you are doing what you have heard. Okay? And as you put more of the senses to work in this, how you touch, how you smell, how you feel, how you taste, all those things, the more you get the rest of your body involved in this, the more likely it is that you will not forget what you have heard, and instead you'll be blessed. That's what James says here. And then he says these words. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceives themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let's pray together. Bow your heads with me if you would. Father, as uh, we come to this end of chapter 1 of James, I think it's just amazing how your providence is so real that we could talk about what true religion means, especially as it relates to widows and caring for widows and caring for orphans, and in our midst today are two people who they're not looking for credit for this, but they live this out. And there are other people in our church that are living this out. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to remind ourselves that there are some very basic, down-to-earth, core values that James is talking about here that need to be part of our life as well. Speak to us today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are three things here that I want to talk to you about today. What does a true relationship with God look like? What does it look like? Here's the first thing. True believers control their tongue. True believers control their tongue. Now, it's not the first time that he speaks about this, and it's not going to be the last time that he speaks about it as well. He's going to talk a lot about the control of your tongue in uh, James chapter 3, but I want you to read over again in verse 26. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. That's pretty strong language, isn't it, when you think about it? I mean, if you can't control what comes out of your mouth, you can say, I'm religious, I'm religious, I'm religious, I'm more religious than anybody around me. But the reality is, is if you cannot control what you're tongue is speaking out into the relationships that you have, that you are deceiving yourselves and your religion is worthless. That is really strong language for, and we don't need to make this more complicated than it already is. Here's the bottom line for this part of the message. True followers exercise discipline, uh, exercise discipline over their tongue. How are you with that? Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up 
in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. So there's this clearinghouse right here of good and bad, and it's in our heart. And then he says this, he says, for out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. In other words, when you say something, no matter what it is, it's going to reflect what is real in your heart. And so what you say and how you say it and when you say it, that reveals a huge amount about the condition of your heart. What he's saying there is basically what I heard one man say is this, that who you are will leak out of your mouth. And boy, there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? And some of us had really good times and some of us had not so good times with our mouth. But here's the bottom line. You can't cover it up. You can't cover it up. Those that you work with, that live with, that you associate with know a lot about your heart because of what they hear coming out of your mouth. What you, can, what you say can betray, betray the external things. And we can say we want to look like we're religious, but our speech doesn't, doesn't carry that message. Psalm 141.3 says, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And I think there's just an enormous amount of truth. Think about how many times that you've said something, and when it got to about right here, you're going, oh, I want to bring that back. You ever been there? Oh, I'll have. I've done it in sermons. I've done it in conversations. I thought that wasn't good. That's not, this is not going to, emails are going to come flowing in. There's no doubt about it. It's just what's going to happen. But sometimes we, we need to control our tongue. We need to have a tight rein on our tongue. Now, that word rein means you're going to control it. It comes from horses. If you probably will remember some of you grew up in farms and stuff, that you use the rein to control the horse, don't you? And sometimes that can be a good thing or sometimes that can be a bad thing. And what James says here is don't allow your tongue to run off unbridled at all. Control your tongue. It's so practical. Think about how it relates to you in various areas of your life. For instance, have you ever said something to your wife or ladies, if you've ever said something to your husband and the second you said it, you thought, I am going to pay a big price for that, right? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that your spouse is vindictive and mean and looking for a way to grind you into the ground, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about a lot of times we use our speech and it can destroy people, can't it? It can just chop them up. And we've got to be very careful how we speak and who we speak and when we speak and all of those things. And if we're not careful about that, you're going to find yourself on the receiving end of something not very pleasant, whether it be verbal or physical or any other way. So, control your tongue, okay? Second thing is this, express compassionate love. Express compassionate love. Look what he says there. Religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this. In their distress and to keep one, or no, I read that wrong, is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now we'll look at that last phrase in just a second, but I want to talk about compassionate love for a second. I noticed something since we've been in Oklahoma City for the last three years, and I think it happened in Tulsa, but we didn't get to Tulsa that much. We were pretty well kind of, you know, surrounded by Owasso, and so we didn't do a lot of that. But in Oklahoma City, I have seen that people like to stop and sit their chair down in an intersection and panhandle for money, right? They kind of thing. Well, I was in Joplin this week and uh, was kind of hanging out and going to preaching teaching convention and at the college and different stuff but every time I left my hotel there was somebody at the end of the road right before you got on the highway who was wanting money you know somebody holds up a sign and says hungry anything will help okay I can get that uh, but it doesn't mean necessarily I'm very compassionate because most of the time I'm uncomfortable by that I'm uncomfortable especially when the light turns red and you got to sit there next to him for uh, a minute or a minute and a half or two minutes and you're thinking, how do I get out of this? I, I don't, this is uncomfortable for me. So I was wrestling with this this week because there was a guy that was there at that intersection almost the entire week. 
except for one time. And that one time was one of the mornings, and it was kind of cold. It wasn't super cold, but it was cool. And it just said this on his sign. He was in a wheelchair, and it said, on my last leg. Need help. And I, I got to admit, I, I, don't, I don't shine in this area at all. I just thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. Now we're going after the last leg argument, you know. But then when I looked at him, I realized something. He only had one leg. Oh. And as I turned and drove down the road, I kept thinking, oh, I sure hope he's not there tomorrow morning. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then I started thinking about this message and thought about expressing compassionate love. And then you go through all this argument. Well, what's compassionate and what's not? Are they taking advantage of you or are they not? You know, I've read stories where some of these people, they're uh, at the street corner, the lights and everything, and they're making $50,000 a year just by doing all. And so I get, I wrestle with this for sure. James says, religion that, our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to watch out after the orphans and watch out after the widows, people who are doing with less maybe than what they ever dreamed they would. And I don't know about you if, you, if you wrestle with this or not. I did, and he was there the next morning, and I did throw a dollar or two his way, but I thought, you're on your last leg. I really ought to be doing more. And I don't know what to do with that exactly. Here's one thing that we struggle with in the church is we've become so consumer-based. In other words, we want the temperature right. We want the lights right. We want the music not too loud but not too soft. We want the sermon not to be too long. And uh, we would go with shorter if, if you could talk me into it. But, uh, you know, we have all these things about consumerism in dealing with the church and yet, sometimes right out on our corner, just down the road, is an opportunity for us to express compassionate love. Now, I don't know how, what that is for you. All I can say is what it is for me, and I have some work to do in that area. I really do. Well, then I got to thinking about this this morning as I was sitting back here listening. I thought, how appropriate, Ted and Bev, that you were here today. I mean, because we're talking about orphans, and we're talking about widows, and we're talking about people who are maybe, you know, in a difficult situation and how you all have stepped into the gap. And then I think about some of the people I know in this church who have become foster parents. I think, how cool is that? I mean, they're just pouring their life into these kids so these kids could have some kind of safe environment to grow up in. And I think that's right what we're talking about right here. And what I want you to see is, and I'm not being very articulate this morning, but I just want you to know that it's not about the numbers, it's about your heart. And uh, I, it's taken me 30 years to figure that out. And I can assure you that when I was preaching in 1987 through about 94, all I cared about was the numbers. You just had to be doing better. And you know what you end up doing? And, and I don't know how else to say this, and so if it's inappropriate, I'm sorry, but you just end up chasing your tail. You know, you're always looking for something better and bigger and all that kind of stuff. And it, it isn't healthy, is it? And so the last 10 years or so, maybe 15 years, I've kind of changed my thought process about that and asked myself questions. Who are we helping? I love it that you come to church here. But I'd like to know who you're helping. I mean, who... Who have you run on to and felt uncomfortable about, especially when they would say something like, on my last leg, and it was literally true? See, doesn't that seem to be maybe a better depiction of who this church is, is how we're helping people in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, even inside our church? I mean, I think we're healthy here in a lot of ways. I've seen times in the last three years where in a last minute thing, we've said, if you want to help this family with this issue, just bring some money and put it up here on the stage. And we do these step offerings. And I remember the first time it came up, I was in my bedroom at home and one of the elders called me and said, hey, we, we want to do a step offering to help these people. And you know what my question was? What's a step offering? I didn't know at all. And he told me and I thought, okay, let's see how that works out. And you know what? It worked out pretty well. 
I know of another church up in Wichita that took up a special offering and they got well over a million dollars in that offering. It's a massive church. And you know what they did with it? They took that money and they went and paid off medical bills for a bunch of people in their community. That might fit James 1 there, you know? And I mean, you can go all the way around. I know churches that do what we call dollar drives or dollar offerings, and you just put a dollar in the offering plate, and every dollar, dollar bill that goes into the offering plate then goes to a specific need that elders or leaders or somebody knows about, and, uh, and it's a beautiful expression. It can be tens of thousands of dollars in large churches, or it can be just $500 in a church that's smaller, but it's still the opportunity to show compassionate love. And here's why it's so important. It's important that we have this kind of expression of, trans- of, of our transformed heart by showing compassionate love because then that person who's receiving that gift may not feel alone. And you know what? Some of the hardest things that people go through in their life, they go through alone. I think about my mom right now and she's going through all kinds of stuff and I just think about my dad who's just devoted to being with her every step of the way. And I think that's compassionate love. And I'm amazed at that. I don't know why I'm amazed, but I am. It touches my soul. Calvin Miller wrote a book called A Taste of Joy. And he wrote about a wealthy woman who was found dead in her home. And she had lived alone all of her life. And the coroner came along and found that there was no organic reason for her death at all. And Miller commented this way. He says, I think the cause of her death was neglect. She was weary of setting a single plate at the table and fixing her coffee one cup at a time. The old woman had written in her calendar only one phrase. No one came today. What a terrible way to live. And how lonely that must be. And what an obvious target that that woman should have been for the church. Who would at least come alongside and sat at the table and made her do two settings for the coffee. And how much of a difference that might have made in her life. I want you to know something. If a church is consumed with the idea of serving other people through compassionate love, the world will notice it. They will. I think about what we're doing in food pantry. That's compassionate love. And so every fourth Tuesday of the month, third or fourth, Elaine, third Tuesday of the month, people line up outside our door to come in to get groceries, and they get groceries. And you know what? That is an expression of your love for them when you give money toward that or bring groceries, whatever you do. And you're feeding those people. And I suppose it wouldn't be that big of a deal if you've never been hungry. But if you've been hungry, or if you've been with people that are hungry, then you know what an impact that is on people's lives just to get sacks of groceries that they could use. And frankly, it doesn't take all that much to do that, does it? So here we have James saying at the end of his chapter, here, religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. You can imagine no matter where you are and no matter who you're running into that there are people that are in distress. And the question is, is what would you do with that? We'll talk about that in just a minute. Now the third thing comes from the last phrase in this passage. He's already talked about it once. But now he's going to talk about it again. And he says, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. John MacArthur says that it is the perpetual obligation of believers to be characterized by moral purity. I don't agree with everything John John MacArthur says, but that thing I do, I do believe what he said there. That that's what we should be characterized as people who are morally pure. And James says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent early in in the chapter. And then he comes back and he takes one more shot at it in the bottom of the chapter when he says, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And you'll remember that a couple weeks ago, I think I talked about the Super Bowl halftime thing and how raunchy that was and all that stuff. But what could we expect? They're they're non-believers. They were not, we were not their target at all. And they made no bones about that. We're not their target. 
But one of the things that we have to make sure and do is, is that we don't become so connected to the world that we don't look any different than the people who the target was. That would be a disaster. Now, when I think about pollution or stains, I go back to my upbringing in Oregon where the water of the lakes were crystal clear and beautiful. That's not always been the case to lakes I've gone to in Oklahoma, um, but in Oregon they are. Or you go to the ocean and you see how beautiful the ocean is and the power of the ocean. You know what is one of the sad things about the ocean now, though? Is that all of this plastic that's being dumped out into landfills and so sort of somehow makes it to the ocean and it comes right back in. And I've seen some beaches that are just amazingly dirty. They didn't used to be that way. But we dump our pollution wherever we are and hope that it'll all work out. Or how many of you have gotten a stain on something and really wish you hadn't done that? I had that happen to me this week too. I was eating too fast and I got to here and the food went to here. And, uh, you know, I said, oh man, I would need to go back and change shirts. I don't want to go back and change shirts. So I'll wear a sweater over the top of it. Nobody will know for sure. So John writes in 1 John chapter 2, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's not room in your heart for the love of the Father and love of the world. Did you hear me in that? There is not enough room in your heart for love for the Father and love for the world. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. And John says, don't love the world at all. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and what he, or, yeah, what he has and does not come from the Father, but it comes from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. I think we need to do a little bit of a morality check sometimes in our life. And guess what? It's not up to me to find out what's moral for you at all. That's what we do when we lay ourselves beneath the cross and we say, Jesus, save us. Save us. And if we will do that with a heart full of uh, compassion for other people, but also just a greater sense of morality, I think that we're going to end up being in the right place. So how do you measure your faith? How do you determine whether your faith is genuine or whether it's false? You see, it's more than just persevering and it's more than just standing against trials. It's receiving and responding to the word and it's showing up in practical ways in how we live. So what I want to do today with this, this kind of the background, we're going, to, we're going to switch things up and not do the same invitation song at all. And guys, I'm going to ask you to just to dim the lights, not completely down, but uh, down halfway or something like that. And uh, Sam's going to come up and play a little bit of music. And what I want to use, uh, let's go up just a little bit, can we, guys? Just so I can see. There you go, that's good. Um, what I'm going to do is lead us in some directive prayer. And we're going to actually just, I'm going to ask you just to talk to God about where you're at when it comes to these things in your life. So I'd like you to I'd like you to really put everything down that you got in your hands so there's no distraction. And I'd like for you just to answer these questions in a prayer, okay? And so bow your heads if you would with me, please. I want to ask you these questions. What does our speech reveal about the true condition of our heart? You go back to that moment in Jesus's ministry when he talked about out of the overflow of the mouth the heart speaks what does your speech reveal about who you are in Christ are there some tensions and some some difficulties there and with the next minute or so would you just pray and humbly ask God to teach you about the relationship between your speech and your heart.
maybe we're not the right person to ask about this. What would your wife say about your speech? What would your husband say? What would your children say? Children, they're probably the most honest people we have in our lives. What would they say about the condition of your heart? Secondly, how compassionate are you when it comes to the most vulnerable in our lives? I'm not up here to tell you what what measures as compassionate or what doesn't. I'm just asking you to evaluate it yourself with Jesus. priority does purity take in your faith? Do you think about purity? Do you think about holiness? Or have you just moved along past those things and have this construct of faith in your life it may not look anything like what God wants it to look like or it may look like absolutely the most right thing. Are you pure? Have you determined in your life that you will keep yourself from being polluted by the world? Or do you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom? Your consistency, your faithfulness, your heart for those who struggle. All of them, God, really do reveal what condition our heart is in. Father, as we get ready to end our service today, I pray that we will think more about and be more convinced than than ever that what you say really matters. It may not be the person sitting next to us or the person up on a stage. What really counts is is what you say and how you view the, the condition of our life, the transformed heart that we're supposed to have. I pray that in the coming days that you would speak through these three statements. They're in the bulletin. You take them with you. And you'll be reminded over and over and over that it isn't even old time religion that really counts. It's just a faith. A faith that is built on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. God, humble us. Help us to see and to feel, to touch when it comes to how we're living our life. Are we real? Is it truthful and faithful? Does the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we serve, the generosity that we have in our life, does that really Allow you, God, to see that you have a room full of servants who are willing to do whatever it takes to be pleasing to you and to meet the needs of others around us. In Jesus' name, amen.